So we have a quorum, yes? Okay, great. Well, then we will officially call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone. We now have a quorum and we'll begin the meeting of the Oklahoma City Arts Commission for February 19th, 2024. Before the commission votes on each item, I will ask staff to provide details of each case. I will ask if the applicant has anything to add and I will ask if any members of the public wish to speak. If you wish to address the Arts Commission, you will be recognized. Please go to the central podium, state your name and address for the record, and begin your comments. Please limit your comments to no more than three minutes. Our next item is to receive the minutes, the meeting minutes for January 25th special meeting. Since we are receiving the minutes and not approving them, all commissioner member, commission members may make motions to receive and to vote, whether they attended that particular meeting or not. So I will ask for a motion in a second to receive the minutes. Okay, looks like it's uh, done and we'll vote in prime go. Mr. Chairman, it, it's not letting me in, so. Huh? I, I'm sorry, what? It's, it's not letting me in. Yes. So are we calling for a voice uh, voice vote? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. It has passed. And we'll move on to three items of discussion. Item 3A, prison presentation of the three site-specific sculptures to be located at Oak by artist Brad Oldham and Christy Coltrane. And Randy will introduce the artists. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thanks for being here today. Randy Marks, Arts Liaison. Uh, so today we are very happy to have Brad Oldham and Christy Coltrane, who are going to present the public art that will be gracing the new Oak development at Northwest Expressway and Pennsylvania Avenue. It's to my knowledge the largest single investment of, for public art on private property, privately owned property in Oklahoma City. I may be wrong about that, but I believe that's correct. Uh, we'll do some research to see if that is in fact correct. But anyway, I'm gonna stand by that for right now. And with that, here are Christy and Brad to tell you about what they're going to propose. Let me bring the slide. Let's see, let me bring this up to date. Okay, we are not advancing this, Rob, you, you can. Okay, thank you. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Christy Coltrane, 1200 Ross Avenue, Suite 180, Dallas, Texas, 75202. And I'm Brad Oldham at the same address, 1200 Ross Avenue, Suite 180, Dallas, Texas, 75202. Thank you, we're excited to be here today and tell you about the work that we've, thank you, we're excited to be here today and share our work with you. Um, here we go. So this is site-specific sculpture that we were commissioned to create for Oak. We have three sculptures and they were um, from the Veritas development and the Dobson family. The first sculpture is called Cloud Trees. And this is something that we thought about because we, the dynamic relationship that the folks from Oklahoma have with the sky, it's sort of life-giving, life-taking, you're always looking at the sky, and we wanted to capture that feeling, and also just the earth, you know, just the, the red earth. And so we wanted to bring these two forces together, and in doing so, we came up with bronze trees reaching up and then having the clouds come down to create the top canopy of the tree. And when you're standing in the three trees, there's an oculus in the middle that you can look up and see the sky. So this is an invitation to look up and take a moment and really appreciate the sky. And uh, with the clouds being mirror polished stainless steel, you can see yourself 
and you can feel the ground. So it's just this, it's going to be this really, really cool experience that we're very excited about. The trees are internally lit. And then I'm going to, let's see what else. I'm going to turn this over to Brad, because mm -hmm. there we go. This, uh, I handle most of the production and uh, the installations on these things. And the, this is a very large sculpture. It weighs about 65,000 pounds. It's about 42 feet across, 33 feet deep, and ends up being about 26 feet tall. Um, it's currently, part of it is almost here, and the other part will be here soon. Um, you can see it's, it takes about six hours per square foot to polish to a mirror finish stainless steel. So it's a tremendous amount of time we've had into this, and uh, it's going to really kind of make that area in a very interactive, because as the clouds go by, they will reflect into the sky, and as people walk by, they reflect into it. So it's, it's a really fun experience to be around something like this. Most of you have seen uh, Anish Kapoor's piece, uh, Cloud Gate, which is called, people call it the Bean in Chicago. Um, but it, this has a very similar feel to it. This is, this is at our foundry. Um, so because I install everything, and I, I travel to the foundry multiple times a year, this is just before we disassembled it to package it to, to come here. And you can see it's kind of in parts and pieces. The bronze is not finished, but it shows you what the power of the sky and the reflection, reflectivity of it. It's uh, what, what it, these are some of the images that show you how big it is. And how it's built the bones. Yeah, the internal structure. Uh, this is uh, engineered to 150 mile an hour wind shear. So it should hold up through just about anything. And do you see Brad there for scale? <laughs> in the, the lower right corner. Just a few more pictures. This is one of my team members that have been working with me for 12 years. This is Freddie. So when we inspect this, since we have to install it, we go inside of it and look how it's built and what we have to do. And this is just one of the access points. I was in there too, but I just decided to take the picture. All right. And then we have a second companion sculpture at Oak called Cloud Puncher. And this is where uh, a bronze cowboy is roping and wrangling an errant cloud that is on the second story pool deck of the Lively Hotel. And he's going to bring this cloud back to cloud trees. And uh, we really wanted to have this feeling of, um, you know, a human element in here too. And the cowboy is very big. You'll see with Brad in some of the pictures. Um, he's bronze and he's sort of looking down. But he doesn't have, um, you won't be able to tell an age, a race, or really too much about him because we want people to identify with the sculpture and have like a, almost a, a cowboy blank slate to project on. Yeah, so he's, he's kind of dug into the ground. This, this is a, almost as complicated an install as the other piece, and it was a lot of work to install. We'll get to the next picture. So if I was standing next to this cowboy, um, that kind of shows the scale of it. It sits about 25 feet off the ground. Um, the bronze rope, for, for example, from the cowboy to the cloud weighs about 1,800 pounds. It's got a structural stainless pipe that runs all the way through the center of it. And uh, the finish is not on this piece in, on the cloud or the bronze in this, but it's a nice rich tone uh, for the bronze and the, the mirror finish for the cloud. And this piece we're going to install in about three weeks. So the, they'll still be under development there. It won't be unwrapped all the way. But, and they're going to fence it off so that nobody hits it. But it's, it's going to be up and excited to unwrap it at some point. You guys are the first to see the progress shots. We haven't shown any behind the scenes because we really don't like to do that until you can see how it goes together. Because people are like, what is it going to look like when it's finished? It looks like a pile of metal. But we thought that you guys would appreciate just getting the backstory. Yeah, so to the right is uh, the cloud after it's been polished. You can see on the right lower side, there's a steel pipe, a square pipe that comes out of it. That slides over another pipe that has been welded to the building. That's the main support for it. And then it cantilevers to the ground where it has a different connection that keeps it from moving. And you can see it's a, it's a fairly large bronze. And then there was a bigger question about, hey, what, what about people on the pool deck? Are they going to be able to climb onto this? And you can see it's very wide. Uh, from left to right, it's, it would take like a Spider-Man or a mountain climber to uh, be able to have enough hand strength to pull up on it. We did really like how you almost get this bonus sculpture from the pool deck because like Brad's shown you there, 
there's that sculpture. And then when you look past it, you'll see down and have cloud trees down in Oakwood Park on the other side of the park. And the belt buckle that you can see is the, uh, the logo for Oak at OKC. So mm -hmm. that's, that's on the, the cowboy's belt. Yeah, we call him Orion. Right? Yeah, Orion. So. Yeah. All right, there's another rendering. And then the third significant artwork is called The Mighty Oak. And this is a um, bronze sculpture that'll be at the corner and just creating a sense of you have arrived and setting the tone for the project. Yeah, it goes at the corner of 50th and Penn, Pennsylvania, and it'll sit up about four feet in the air uh, on, on a wall. It looks small in that rendering, but it's actually 22 feet long, 10 feet tall, and it, it's about 18 inches or 24 inches deep. So that's kind of a better, uh, shows you the scale on it. That's it. And oh, this, yeah. this kind of explains the process and mm -hmm. some of the, the sizes and weights and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, it's a, a recap of it. Thank you for listening to us yeah. and we hope, we really look forward to the day when you get to come out and see the sculptures. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if we're supposed to answer any questions. Oh. Qu ah, here we go. I have a question. Actually, I have several questions. First, I'd like to say, though, I think this is a really fun sculpture. Uh, I think people are going to like it. Um, Thank you. My uh, first question is with regards to the stainless steel uh, elements, which when they're nice and clean and shiny will look wonderful. Is there anything, uh, how, how much maintenance is it going to take to keep it in the kind of condition that will make it attractive to look at? The reason we use 316 stainless is because it's minimal maintenance. Uh, when it rains, it rinses it off. Other than that, other than like on the pool deck, if somebody spills a drink on it, they'll have to clean it, but most of the time it's gonna be looking really good. We have some sculpture that's been out in public for 15 years. People and people sitting on it. Yes, yeah, I mean, they're a little scratched, but from the street, they look great. Um, and even up close, they still look good. They just show that they've been a little loved. And it is marine grade, too, right? Yeah, it's mar marine grade stainless steel. So it's, it's very durable. It doesn't rust. And when you use it in this, this format where it's polished, it holds up. And if it does scratch, say somebody scratched a name in it, we could come back and sand and polish that back out. OK, my other question. Um, with regards, and you sort of alluded to it with the cloud puncher um, sculpture, the uh, rope that extends up to the cloud. Um, for some reason, it reminds me of the a piece, I think it's at the Nasher Sculpture Garden in Dallas, that you, it was called, I think, Going to the Sun, oh, and it is a, a line with people mm -hmm. uh, going up and up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up a ramp, uh, just that kind of upward trajectory. Is it wide enough for people to try to tightrope walk on? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very round. It's about a seven inch diameter. So I think if you were, say you had a tightrope tight rope expert, he could probably do it barefoot. With shoes, you're gonna fall. And it's also a big enough diameter that you can't just grab it. It's very hard. Oh. I guess you could sloth shimmy your way up it. Mm -hmm. But it also starts at the edge of his feet. It's seven feet off the ground. And this is not a private park with nobody around. There's security. There's a, we had many of these discussions because we talked about whether to make the rope prickly so that it hurts your hands. That's still not going to stop a stupid person from trying something. So we decided to make it somewhat, <laughs> somewhat slick so that it didn't have anything to really hang on to. We felt like that was the best avenue to make it safe. Okay, and what variety of oak specifically was the model for the oak sculpture? Well, we call it the mighty live oak, and <laughs> it, it was rendered after a live oak, but we took a little bit of liberty as well. So it's obviously it's a large sculpture. It's not an exact replica of an oak leaf, but it looks most like a, a live oak. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. And then I did want to add, Commissioner Cooper, that when we create these sculptures, we do try to use the low maintenance materials and design because 
like for us, it's a billboard of our work and we want it to look really good too. Like we are very vested in what you're seeing, that that is a reflection of our work and we want it to look nice forever. I mean forever, long after long we're gone. Long. Any other questions? But we appreciate the pride you have in your work. Oh, thank you. Oh, great, okay. Uh, when is the installation? Um, it's going to be over the next two months. So the first one, Cloud Puncher, will install in about three weeks. And then Cloud Trees will come about four or five weeks after that. And then the Oak Leaf is the last part that we're waiting on. I think there's a restaurant right there on the corner that we're waiting on them to, yeah, Capitol Grill. We're waiting to, for them to get their outer walls finished before we try to plop that in. So I would say by the end end of April or mid-May, we, we will be off-site, only needing to come back to unwrap it later in the late summer or early fall, whenever they decide to open it up. Oh, I have another question. Commissioner, if you would <laughs> Big surprise. Uh, are you planning to have any kind of event uh, as a form of dedication to your public art? As far as we know, Ryan has scheduled a uh, sort of a dedication event for the entire facility that will we will be a part of that. So we will, we've already told September. 50 people, so we're gonna fill up half the hotel. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we're really proud of it. We'll bring as many people as we can from the Dallas area. I don't know, do you know the date in September? He said September 2nd, but I don't know if that's still the, the date. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, you guys can sit. And yeah, thank you for your time today. Vote. Thank you. So at this point, uh, we'll call for a motion in a second to receive the report. Somebody, anybody? Ms. Steele. Um, I was wondering if we can have a resolution that would commend the Oak for their investment in the arts in Oklahoma City, because this is quite a large investment. That's a Randy question. That? So we would take the vote on the, on the receiving the report first. And then uh, Rita, can that just be a, a by voice vote uh, on the resolution to commend the developers of the oak? Yes. Okay. So you'll vote on on receiving the report first, and then there will be a voice vote on on uh, Commissioner Nowser's recommendation. So we'll entertain Commissioner Nowser's recommendation after we finish the vote. Yes. Okay. Great. So what? So it passed, yeah. And, and do we need a second for her, her motion to have a resolution? Okay, so yes, on the, on the uh, recommendation to uh, commend the developer, it's just a voice vote and by, or by acclamation, so you can all say. Aye. 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 Okay. Love it. okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 3B, Bolt Tower by Jimmy Sabine Studio, 1% for art, for the review new, for the new Coliseum at the Oklahoma State Fairgrounds. And Randy will present. So we just recently had the final selection meeting for the Fairgrounds Coliseum and Bolt Tower, the proposal by, or the conceptual design by Jenny Sabin Studio was the work that was selected by the selection committee so uh, Jenny Sabin Studio, it's an experimental architecture studio based in Ithaca, New York. Ithaca is the home of Cornell University. Jenny teaches in, in the uh, art and, uh, excuse me, in the uh, architecture and uh, art and planning department at Cornell University. So here on the left, you see the image of the Bolt Tower 
and it embodies uh, Jenny Sabin Studio's mission to create a contextually sensitive, data-driven, engaging, and transformative uh, space for the communities of Oklahoma City. This tells you a little bit about the process that Jenny goes through in coming up with her designs. So they started off with a motion study of that uh, of a video actually taken from an event at, at the fairgrounds some years ago about, um, about um, horse riding and barrel racing and we don't know, I don't, can't say that I understand exactly how she did this. Uh, Commissioner uh, Bailey may have something to add to that a little bit. But this helped inform the, their design. The, mo the most important thing that I want to get across here is the, is the materials that are being used. So there is a skin of polycarbonate, which has basically an indefinite lifespan that is covered with dichroic film that gives it the color that you're seeing. And these uh, polycarbonate dichroic small panels will be able to move in the wind. So the skin is going to be something that is going to appear to be alive because it will respond to the wind. And all of this is on a steel mesh securely anchored into the rest of the structure. Excuse me. I, yeah, well, poly, poly, it, it is in this case. So polycarb polycarbonate generally can be a lot of different colors. It is. It is, and so this is a good question. All of the color comes from the dichroic film. So the dichroic uh, acts almost like a prism and creates this rainbow of colors that changes with movement. So another component of the project is uh, community engagement. So they will put out a call to uh, that the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs will obviously help them with to gather images of historic uh, images of the, of the State Fair and people's experiences at the State Fair. So these images can be also printed onto the polycarbonate panels. So there'll be, th those will be incorporated in the overall design as well. Now on this particular piece, so I mean on this particular slide, I want you to, I want you to look at the um, image that is inside the skin, this image that looks like that. This is going to be 3D printed steel sculpture. And it is, uh, some of you may be familiar with MIG welding in which there is a wire feed that comes out of, out of the welding gun and you apply that and you can build up the surface that way. This will be done by a special Lincoln Electric 3D printer that uses that same technology but is ro that robotically creates that form in the center. Uh, as a former MIG welder, this really excites me. This is another one of those wonkish things that I, I really like, and I would love to see that process. Unfortunately, that's going to take place in Cleveland, Ohio, instead of here. Uh, but there is that steel component in the middle. And then this is another view of, it, uh, of the work. So the recommendation from the selection committee well, first of all, in the deliberations with the selection committee, at some point, one of the committee members asked, would it be possible to entertain another location for this work at the fairgrounds rather than right at the entryway? And so we consulted with Rita Douglas Talley on this question, and she was, of course, in attendance at the meeting, and she said, yes, that could come as a recommendation also. So in addition to the recommendation uh, for Ginny Sabin's design, there's also a recommendation that we look at the site of the former Space Needle or Space Tower at the fairgrounds. And it does seem to be ideally suited for that particular space. Uh, there has been, of course, an ongoing lament about all of the things that have been lost at the fairgrounds over the years. 
and we see this work as starting the movement back in another, in, in another direction. It would have that function at the entrance, but it might have far more of that function right at the heart of the fairgrounds. Anyway, Rita confirmed it is within the purview of the commission to recommend and definitely from the selection committee to consider another, an, another spot. And so that is coming as a re recommendation today also. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll take questions. Yes, it can all it can all be rolled into one recommendation. Is it better now? <laughs> Does anyone else have recommendations or questions? Okay, I guess we've got a motion here, and we're including. Oh. So in regard to the recommendation, I mean, typically these are located on the grounds of whatever project. Did, is that a concern that the Bennett Event Center might, do they have any concern that we would take their, basically their art and move it somewhere else on the fairgrounds? So this was actually, this was settled a long time ago and it actually came up in a, in a previous uh, a discussion about a previous work Cliff Garton's uh, work that is in the Bennett Event Center. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the new, I mean the Coliseum, not the, sorry. would the Coliseum be upset that the art that's part, part of the project is moved elsewhere around the fairgrounds? Yeah, I'm, it didn't sound like I was addressing it, but I'm addressing okay. that. Well, I, I misspoke too, I wanted to just clarify that. So, so it, 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 the question came up and we consulted with maps back at that time uh, about is there the possibility of, of moving the artwork from the, you know, dead on with the project that is being done or could the funds be used elsewhere? Uh, so MAPS answered and their legal uh, team confirmed that they regard the entire fairgrounds as the site. And so, um, and, and so that is the general answer. The specific answer was about, about the Coliseum was that there was some advantage not having it right next to the Coliseum for construction purposes. So we addressed this about two years ago when we first started planning for this. And it was decided that the ideal site, as we did site analysis right next to the Coliseum, there wasn't strangely a good site just because of the strangeness of the configuration of that site. And so that was part of the reason why the entrance of the fairgrounds was considered at that point. So we're building upon that now. Now, seeing this design and seeing what Jenny has proposed, the committee felt like that if they had the potential for it to be moved, another location would actually be stronger and be better for the, for the work and for the community. Okay. I have a question too about that. Is the State Fair Board in agreement that the relocation is a better, or, or have they not weighed in on it yet? David Reeves, who's the, I, I don't, I'm not going to get his title exactly correct, but basically he's the number two person at, at uh, the fair. And David was on the selection committee. And so uh, we, we don't typically go to the fair board. We deal with staff. And they, if they want to consult with the fair board, then that is up to them. That's, that's not what we do. David was in complete agreement that this should go to the other side. So are we oh, well, approving so not, their recommendation? Not, or are we coming up with, is this going to appear to be a recommendation of our body out of, without really the benefit of the overall discussion regarding the placement of the piece of art? What, what are we doing on this recommendation? Okay, so exactly. Just to back up a little bit, Bob Nealon, who is on the fair board, also is on on the uh, selection committee, and he's wholeheartedly in favor also. So this is, this is typical of how we build our selection committees. We, we, we have those people that have special interest as part of the selection process. The selection committee, uh, in some cases, has wide latitude in what they can recommend. 
In this case, not only are they recommending the conceptual design by the artist, they're recommending that the work be cited in another location at the fairgrounds. And that is, their, that is the selection committee's recommendation to the Arts Commission. So we're, so we're really voting in agreement with their recommendation? With, with the selection committee's so recommendation. this is not a recommendation from the Arts Commission. The reason I ask is because we haven't really had, I mean, it's one thing for us to say, if they're in agreement, we agree that they're in agreement, it's fine. We don't have a problem with it. But if you're saying it's our recommendation, a part of our responsibility would be to look at all the choices, and we haven't done that. Okay. I, so I'm a little bit concerned about making a recommendation for a location when we haven't studied the location possibilities. So what do you recommend in that regard? Can I, can I, I would like to address the you. chair. Um, I served on the selection committee for this. So this, what is being presented to you is the recommendation from the selection committee in whole. We are not making any individual choices that the selection committee did not present unanimously and vote on together. Um, I would say that uh, there were some really strong pieces that were sent back as part of our finalists. Um, in fact, there was much as what happens a lot is like, well, I wish we could have them all and we could put this here and put this here. But um, there's a piece to this that uh, Randy touched on that Ginny put into the piece where there is going to be an enticement for the public to look at this piece closer. This is not a piece that's designed that is meant to be looked at only from a vehicle. Like there are elements of it that will be really wonderful and beautiful to stand underneath and stand next to. And so um, when that was made, when that was brought up and when the committee began discussing moving the piece to a site where the public can safely interact with it, it was unanimous that that was the right decision because um, it would be fully appreciated in that location and it would become a moment for people to take photos with and to interact with and have new memories with. And it would have been a wonderful entrance marker as well, but the, the committee, the selection committee felt very strongly that when we discussed that there was another site that could also work for this, um, it might be better that there was no hesitation that that was the right decision. And one of our members of the selection committee also serves on the Coliseum MAPS 4 Coliseum um, Oversight Committee. There, th there were plenty of people involved in that um, selection committee to uh, affirm that all of the um, oversight committees and governance boards for the State Fair would, would also agree with this decision. So I feel like that the um, the item that's been brought forward on the agenda for us to vote on is we are, we are voting um, in response to what has been presented by the selection committee. Okay. And I'll that answer, I don't know, it's a long-winded answer to your question, but I want to assure you that, that, there, that this is something that, that everybody seems to want. So we're, a, we're more or less affirming their yeah. recommendation. I'm just, I, I'm tickled to death to see it in the middle. I've grown up in the city of Oklahoma City and you used to meet people at the Arrows to Adams and then you met them at the Space Tower. And this becomes that big focal point that everyone talks about. It'd be like putting those clouds out there on, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Oh yeah, they're pretty, but it's nothing like to be there and to experience it inside the fair. So I'm all for the putting it in the middle there. I, so who would have the final say on on where it goes. Um, I mean, I asked because, so there's the MAPS 4 subcommittee, which you, there their represent, representative was okay with it. State Fair Board representative okay with it, but would- City of Oklahoma City had a representative that served on the selection committee as well. So the answer is the city council. Okay. And so this recommendation would It just seems weird that the recommendation would come from our body when it could come from MAPS 4 or it could come from the State Fair Board. This is what you're charged, this is what the Arts Commission is charged with. Well. Is to advise, is to advise 
we don't usually get council. into we don't usually get into location selections in regard to one percent for the arts maps projects. Well, I think I'm viewing this as that we would not be thinking about this at all if the original RFP that was approved just had a different location on it. I mean, the the location is, I think, a part of, you know. I was just, like, it, his, I, historically, I guess my disconnect is historically these maps related art projects go with the facility mm -hmm. to enhance the facility and to enhance the art around the facility. And so this is a little bit of a left turn to say, we, here's the money came from this project, but we're gonna put it over here. And I just, I mean, I'm comforted that we had represent, representation on the selection committee from the MAPS 4 subcommittee and the uh, State Fair Board. I just wondered if we need, it'd be nice to have those entities also make that recommendation. I, uh, I mean, I feel like the selection committee made that recommendation with those representatives included in it, which I know is not exactly what yeah, you're right, saying, right. but that is the why, why those particular representatives were appointed to and asked to serve on that is because they did represent the organizations that they would be bringing that information back to. And I felt as a member of the selection committee that that had been vetted with those organizations via the people that they had sent as representatives. Okay. Randy, but, I mean. Randy, did I hear you say that this entire state fair property, all of it is considered the site? It is by maps. Okay, by maps. So, yes, by maps. So, uh, Commissioner Hill, let me, let me say something that may uh, give you some information that may put your mind at ease. So even though, even though this body hasn't uh, deliberated about this exact question before, similar things have come up in conversation with us multiple times with David Todd and with their, the legal team. <clears throat> so from MAP's point of view, it, the artwork is up to the Arts Department and the Arts Commission. David has stated this multiple times. Also, the funds, so uh, there are funds that are left over for in particular projects that can be moved to be used on other projects. This is, we have take, we've asked this question so many times and we get the same answer all the time. The legal team says, yes, on MAPS funds, that is acceptable. Uh, and David has reiterated multiple times, this is the business of the Arts Department and Arts and Cultural Affairs and the Arts Commission. So uh, we're not gonna go back and ask for permission for things. I, I, I would prefer not to go back and ask permission for things that are settled because we've asked this question multiple times. But does that help you a little bit? I mean, does, does that help answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I mean, a bit? it does help me. I just. And, and it's important to remember that it's a recommendation only. So, um, but like I said, I think any time that we have a situation where we're doing something fairly radically different from what we would do with these projects, that we should have some kind of discussion about it and a level of comfort that, that we're inclusive in this decision. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, I, and I largely feel that, so. so Commissioner Bailey's done a nice to job. To go a little bit further, Jim, Jim Shepard, of the, uh, who's the MAPS project manager, has been kept fully apprised of everything. He reports directly to David Todd. He also makes reports to the boards. And David and, uh, and the, everybody at MAPS that we work, work with know that we are willing to come at any time and talk to any of the boards anytime there's any question. We, we do that uh, whenever we're re requested to do so. So there, this is an, there's nothing has been surreptitious about this whatsoever. It's, this is, we consider this just part, n normal procedure for what we do. It feels radical because this is the first time this particular question has come up to this body. Uh, having said all of that, definitely anything like this in the future will make sure that the commission is uh, given more information. Excuse me, let me, um, um, a clarification maybe from, for myself. Is the um, consideration of the piece and the consideration of the location, 
wrapped into one motion, or are they supposed to be two separate motions? Rita advised us that they can be uh, wrapped into one motion. So the motion that is on that is on the floor is for both approval of a recommendation for the piece from the of Bolt Tower as well as its location elsewhere on the fairgrounds. That is my understanding. You made the motion. Yeah. So and that is the motion. I just so wanted to make sure. That, that is that's confirmed that yes, that is the motion. Okay. Okay, so do we have a motion on the floor? We have a okay. motion. Is there then let's vote for it. The computer is misbehaving. Yeah, it's misbehaving. My screen didn't come up. So, yes. So pass. Yay. Can I, make, I just want to make one comment about this. Huh? Um, it was so fun to serve on the selection committee, and this was a very long process um, to get to this piece um, for various reasons, but everybody stayed intact on the selection committee, and I think it made for an even stronger um, kind of uh, a appreciation and understanding of the direction that this piece needed to go in the end. And so, um, it, was, it, was, it was really exciting to see the level of work that was submitted to this and the, um, all the different members that served on the selection committee and their excitement and interest in picking the right piece for this. So it is viewed as a very impactful piece. I mean, it's a, it's a very large project. Um, and this is going to be big, so. <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't talk about it, but that's in, it's envisioned to be a 70-foot 75 foot tall work. Some things may change that to make it taller or a, or a little bit smaller, but that it's envisioned to be 75 feet tall. So it's gonna be very visible from May Avenue, from the highway, um, so on. Okay. Any more questions or discussion? And, and the framework of this piece is, the framework of the piece is what? Steel? It's... Uh, I mean, I know about the dry, dichroic coating and mm -hmm. but the framework the infrastructure the infrastructure is steel and then the skin of the dichroic on polycarbonate is on steel mesh okay. now this is a question we probably this doesn't have anything to do with the quality of art but are any of these art pieces going to end up being an attractor for lightning um, I, I don't even know the answer to, to that question Hopefully they'll clear, Just curiosity. they'll clear the fairgrounds before the people get struck by lightning, Se I would assume. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. 75 feet. Steel is picking. Seven yeah. towers and the attractor for lightning. Yeah. Okay. Carrie, any more questions? No. Okay, thank you. Um, nothing for the consent docket. So do any of the committees have anything to report? Down. Oh, no. Okay. Not, not just commi I, comments from the commission. I'm waiting for comments from the commission. Okay, dope. Um, arts and cultural affairs update. No update. Um, do you? Okay, great. I mean, I can. I know that there was one thing um, that uh, Randy wanted me to mention with this being. Um, Black History Month, but on Thursday, February 22nd, so this Thursday, 11.30 to 1, um, the Oklahoma Arts Council will be joined by the Oklahoma Legislative Black Caucus to dedicate two new works of art at the Oklahoma State Capitol, honoring Clara Looper and Hannah Atkins. So all of the arts commissioners are invited to attend that. It'll be two bronze um, busts of Clara Looper and Hannah Atkins by LaQuincy Reed. Um, and they were made possible by Oklahoma Art and Public Places Program. But hopefully some commissioners can be there to represent. Thank you very much. And we'll send out a reminder email about that as well okay. so that you'll have it right in front of you. What, right. what time? 
It is 11.30 to 1. At the state capitol? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some other mi uh, minor ones just about art things going on, but um, Broadway series, everybody needs to make their way to Wicked. Um, Canterbury Voices will perform for all the saints March 14th. The Philharmonic is joining with Canterbury to do Glorious Life on March 23rd. And um, if you have not seen that the Oklahoma City Museum of Art had it approved that um, every second Sunday of the month will be free. So we really want to push that out and encourage uh, families to go, but also uh, families, visitors, whatever. I know that I've, I'm, I'm planning a wedding, so I've been trying to put together all the great things for um, our visitors to see, and it is filled with all arts events because there's so many great things coming up in coming months. And at the Oklahoma Museum of Art, we also have the preview of Georgia O'Keeffe um, on March 9th, so just around the corner. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, actually, I have uh, from Arts and Cultural Affairs, I have a report. Uh, so this is an update on the new sign ordinance, which uh, some of you um, may have heard something about this week. And so I'm going to uh, do this based upon some Q&A that we've received back over so social media and from some other sources. So anyone can just paint anything on any wall and call it art, call it a mural, right? Well, no, not exactly. Artists and property owners have a lot of freedom, but it is not a free for all. And here are some details. Anything painted on an exterior wall or surface without the permission of the owner of that wall or surface is graffiti. Graffiti is covered in Oklahoma City's Municipal Code in Article 5, so on. The graffiti ordinance has not changed, okay? So you do something that is illegal, it's graffiti, code enforcement will, will be called, and it will be removed or painted, painted over. Property belonging to or managed by the city or ever, other governmental bodies may not be painted without the permission of those organizations. This includes bridges, bridge abutments, sidewalks, streets, retaining walls, dams, and very, very, very much more. Government property is not fair game for murals. Just as it was before, it is not fair game now. Any illustration or wording that is obscene or harmful to minors is prohibited and addressed in Article 8, et cetera, et cetera. This has not changed. You cannot paint even a so-called legal mural that you have agreed with the property owner that, you, that you're going to paint it. You can't do any, anything that is obscene that is not changed under the current ordinance. Any mural painted in a design district or historic preservation district must receive a certificate of approval or a certificate of appropriateness through city planning. That process has to go through or the mural is not legal in design districts only. Any mural that is painted on a surface that is mechanically attached to a wall requires a signed permit. You may remember that recently you saw the uh, Pitts mural at uh, the Wiley Lavore Pitts mural at Pitts Park Recreation Center. That was painted on uh, ACM, aluminum composite material that was mechanically attached to the wall because the wall was eligible to be on historic, on, as a historic site. And so that was the recommendation that was given to us by the State uh, historical, uh, Historic Preservation Office. In that case, a sign permit is required and it must, and the installation must be done by a licensed contractor. In that case, Oklahoma Mural Syndicate became licensed sign contractors. It just made more sense for them to do that. Now they have that capability going forward, but that's another story. And although painted murals are most common, everything that has just been said is also true about vinyl murals. So the next question we're gonna address, 
Are we trying to document our murals? Are murals being submitted to anything at all? What happened to the suggestion of a streamlined self-approval form for new murals, et cetera? So the, current, the city, meaning Arts and Cultural Affairs, currently documents all murals on city-owned property. The Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs plans to document as many other murals as possible as part of an expanded public art database. This will be accomplished as time and funding allows. So we're doing a lot of this internally. Robbie Jones has been, uh, has been spending a lot of time bringing the, uh, our database up to date and documenting, again, everything that is in, in our collection that we do not have any documentation of. We're also working with other departments in planning uh, to create a, a, an interactive map that will have every piece of art that we can possibly put on there on the database that will be available to the public um, to find the city's public art and then also public art in the city as well as other uh, cultural uh, sites also. Except in the cases noted above, murals require no approval other than the approval of the property owner. In cases where some approval or permit is required, the procedure is simplified. For example, murals in design districts can be reviewed and approved by staff without waiting to go to a board or commission. So a lot of what we heard back from artists and property owners is, I would like to get moving on this project. It's now you, you've got to get this permission from the Arts Commission and then it's got to go to design review and sometimes they don't have their meetings and so on and so forth. Projects could be delayed, delayed for months. So now my colleagues, our colleagues, our staff <coughs> in uh, current planning and urban design that administer the design districts can, can, can approve those administratively. In other words, they potentially can be done in 24 hours rather than in six weeks to nine months. So this is a tremendous boon for the citizens of Oklahoma City, but it's still being reviewed. It's not that, again, it's not a free for all. Those are being reviewed. Can anyone paint any sign that they want to? Murals are not signs and a sign is not a mural. If the illustration names a business or a product, it is almost certainly a sign which requires a sign permit. That doesn't change. Certain things about that change, but those are not under the purview of Arts and Cultural Affairs and the Arts Commission. If it merely illustrates something related to a business, it may qualify as a mural. Arts and Cultural Affairs staff can give guidance if there is any question, and then there is our general email. If there is a dog park that wants to paint a mural of dogs on the side, that is not a sign, that is a mural. If, it, if they have that and it says, this is a dog park, that is a sign and has to be permitted as a sign. If you have a picture of Einstein on the side of a building with a quote, E equals MC squared, and, that has, and they're not selling relativity in that building, that's not a sign. If you have Einstein with a quote that says, buy your relativity here, that is a sign and has to be permitted as a sign. So this is a little bit different than it was a couple of years ago where dogs painted on the side of, uh, in a mural on the side of a dog park would have been considered a sign, not any longer. That's a mural, that's art, okay? Owners can do that legally. Can the city provide guidelines for residents and artists in creating murals? What do you think? Of course we can. Arts and Cultural Affairs staff is, as we speak, busily working on a succinct guide to best practices that will be available on the city website property owners and artists. And we hope to have every question that could possibly come up in that very succinct guide. So you re may remember that a little over two years ago, Lisa Chronister, Assistant Planning Director, came before this body and gave you an update on the final, final, final version of the ordinance. That was two years and one month ago. And there has been delay after delay after delay questions that have come up, and finally, 
Tuesday of last week, the city council was able to vote on this particular ordinance. It passed, and it goes into effect March 15th. So everything that we just talked about, the murals, becomes effective March 15th. And with that, Mr. Will this Q&A be included in our minutes? Excuse me? Will the, Will the Q&A be included in our minutes? This um, questions you have up here? We can, uh, we can, we can include, how would we do that, this in the minutes of the meeting? Can we attach those in the minutes? Okay. I yes, think we can. it might be helpful if somebody approached us as arts commissioners with those kinds of questions to have those answers. So, thank you. We will do that. R Randy, uh, I know that, uh, excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, I know that we had a lot of discussion regarding the proposed sign code, including whether or not mur murals and any other kind of art would be viewed as a sign, not a mural or art, and that there have been changes to that code over in the period of time since it was presented to us for our discussion. Could you have, could we be provided with the final adopted copy of the sign code as it, I know it's a huge volume, I don't want the whole thing. That <coughs> portion which pertains to murals and or public art. Yes. And also because of the manner in which, now I'm saying this from what I saw on the media, in, the re in reaction to the adoption by the city council last week, which made it sound like it's a free-for-all out there. That is the impression that was given across, across the media, that there were no, no rules anymore. So I think at some point, somebody needs to prepare sort of a, preempt a preemptory uh, damage control statement saying, well, contrary to the impression that was given upon the adoption of the sign code, there are still rules that apply mm -hmm. to public art, whether or not it's in a private setting or in a public setting. There are still rules that have to be followed. So that to, to try to dilute that impression that was created last week that people can do whatever they want. That's why you've got questions like this that have been asked. And, and something needs to tamp that down. Otherwise, there's gonna, it'll, it'll have to be dealt with in the field when people decide to exercise what their perception happens to be, which may be incorrect. We're working with the Public Information Office on this right now, and they've already released one media advisory, and they will do, they will do more because they're very concerned about this as well. So uh, yes, point, uh, very good point, and, uh, and we are working on it already. Uh, part of the uh, part of the what we intend to have on the website will address that more fully. Also, okay. yeah. will that also include the Facebook for Arts Commission? Excuse me. Any social media for Arts Commission? Would that also include that? So, uh, typically, yes. The short answer is yes. In the interim, if any commissioner is presented with a statement from somebody about the free-for-all in art, they can correct them. You can and should. <laughs> Chair, I've got, I just, I just want to publicly thank Randy and his staff, as well as Lisa Cronister and the planning department for the work they did on this. Um, I think it's the right approach. And I know they had to put up with at least one cranky arts commissioner from time to time in, in regard to this. Um, but very pleased at the direction this went to. And uh, again, uh, Lisa, Lisa did yeoman's work for, like you said, several years on this and, and deserves our appreciation, I think. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. I'll pass that on to her. Objections were coming up a week ago that we're trying to derail this from city council. Uh, so that was the last, one of the last things that um, Lisa had to deal with, was answering those objections so that this could proceed. And those were, they were, they were brought to council, again, everything out in the open, and um, it's done after three plus years. Okay, any more questions on this topic or any other? You got five seconds. 
Questions from commissioners? Or is that section now? Or comments. Okay. <laughs> on, on March 22nd, Oklahoma Contemporary is going to be celebrating its Founders Day, which you may recall a few years ago, they were getting ready to open their brand new building and between the big donor event and the grand opening of the building, COVID happened. So it kind of put everything off. But anyway, every, in, on that anniversary, they have celebrations uh, for uh, Oklahoma Contemporary, and they are honoring a number of members of the community. And this year at, their, at the celebration, they're gonna be honoring one of our own, Mr. J.B. Williams. So I just want everybody to know. Is that it? Okay, great. Um, any more commissioners wish to comment or say anything? Any, any, anything from the public? Excellent. All right, well, then we can adjourn. Thank you for all coming. <laughs>